Matthew chapter 15, verse 10. Let's start in verse 10. Jesus called the people to him and said to them, Listen, listen and grasp and comprehend this. It is not what goes into the mouth of a man that makes him unclean and defiled. Speaking of their rules of certain foods that they could eat and certain foods that they could not eat according to the law. But what comes out of him, out of the mouth, this makes a man unclean and defiles him. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were displeased and offended and indignant when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be torn up by the roots. Okay, also... Um, Matthew chapter 3, the axe lies at the roots of the trees. Okay, so it will be torn up by the roots. So if God didn't plant something, he's going to tear it up. He's going to remove it. He's gonna... And I think that's something to rejoice about. You know, if there's a plant growing in the garden of your heart, it's not supposed to be, thank, thank God, he's going to root it up and take it out. So there's supernatural, heavenly seed from God sown into your heart. Let that grow. Let that be nurtured. Let that, uh, yeah, donkey. Let that grow instead of, you know, the bad stuff, bad words, bad thoughts. If you start meditating on the faults of people, if you start thinking constantly and you know, letting people and their issues stay rent-free in your mind. Before a lot of time passes, before long, you will start saying it. And then resentment breeds. And then offenses come. And before you know it, your whole heart, your whole mind, everything is full of what you thought because what you were thinking was not what the word says. What you were meditating on was not the thoughts of Christ that dwells on the inside of you that we see in the word, but instead thinking of what does that guy do wrong? What, that person said this, that person said that, this person did this, that, this person did that. Always thinking of, uh, you know, what are those people thinking? Do you know what? M most of the time, the people that you think is thinking things about you never even thought about you. Yeah. You know? Just because you're thinking of them doesn't necessarily mean they're thinking of you. Yeah. Okay? But I think it's a better thing to be thinking of Jesus. He will be thinking of you. Yeah. And the stuff that he's thinking of you is good stuff. So I think to have a connection there is much better. You, you know, to... to think bad stuff about other people to not forgive, to think bad stuff of people to harbor resentment. Um, it's like that old saying, it's like drinking slow poison, thinking it will kill someone else. You know, just to spite someone else, you're going to think this of this person and that person. You're harming yourself, okay, especially when you start speaking it. So it's not what comes into the mouth, it's what's coming out of the mouth. So the defilement doesn't happen if you eat bacon. The defilement happens when words come out and those words are not of God. Okay? All right, so Matthew chapter 15. It's not, it's not what goes in into the mouth that defiles, but what comes out. So the thing that is defiled... Is the conscience. James chapter 3, verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers. Now, the Amplified gives a little bit more light of what it means here at teachers. Um, King James just says masters. But he says here, self-constituted censors and reprovers of others. See, it doesn't necessarily speak of someone who teaches others the word. He says... He speaks of people who's constantly criticizing someone else. Okay? Right? So, for you know that 
we will be judged by a higher standard with a greater severity than other people. Thus, we assume the greater accountability and the more condemnation. Okay, but it is for the teachers. If we teach the word of God, it is, you know, we need to teach the truth. It, it, what does it help we teach the word, but we, we put people on, you know, some kind of a way that is not of God? What does that help? What does it help we fill the minds of people with corrupting thoughts? That takes them further away from Jesus and not closer to him. Okay? For we all often stumble and fall and offend in many things. You are worse than you think. <laughs> if you want to judge yourself, you're far worse than what you're aware of. Because you're comparing yourself to the wrong image. <laughs> okay? So compared to where you're supposed to be, where you could be in Christ in manifestation, you know, we need help. Okay? And if anyone does not offend in speech, so there's an if condition. If anyone doesn't offend in speech. Never says the wrong things. He is a fully developed character and a perfect man. Able to control his whole body and to curb his entire nature. Is there some stuff that you need to curb? Is there some stuff that you need to get under control in your life? It's not what goes into the mouth. It's what comes out of the mouth. So what are you saying over your situation? What are you saying over your life, over your family? What are you saying over your finances? What are you saying over your own nature? What are you confessing? What are you believing about the essence of who you really are? So what are you saying over your situation? If you're going to say, yes, but I'm just a sinner, guess what's going to come out of your life? Guess what nature you are stirring up and manifesting in your life? And then you get these four-letter words. And mostly you want to just make four little stars instead of writing them. And you get all kinds of different ones. And they so easily want to come out in traffic. <laughs> or when your boss gives you something you don't like. Or, you know, when your dog pooped on the new carpet. Or, you know, something. Whatever comes. And then you say, oh, Bible says, hold your tongue. There's a board credit with tongue. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, the contents of that four letter word, if you, if you express those things and speak it over your life, no wonder you struggle with this stuff. No wonder you struggle with the thing, the very thing that is the content of the four letter word. So what have you been saying? What have you been expressing over your life? So it is not just, ah, oh, you know, it's grace. God will understand. Sometimes you just need to say, hey, if anyone doesn't offend in speech, he's a perfect man. Okay? Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Okay. Right, so... Um, you have been cleansed and perfected by the blood of Jesus. So speak that. Speak that you have been cleansed and perfected through the blood of Christ. I'm referring to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14. Okay, you have been made holy. And those whom you have made holy, you have forever completely cleansed and perfected. So you are made complete or perfect or reach maturity as a son, 
when you can get your tongue in check and aligned with what the Spirit of God is saying. Let's keep continue reading. If we set bits in the horses' mouths to make them obey us, we can turn their whole bodies about. Any people who love horse riding? Okay. Really? I didn't know. Okay. Growing up, we had horses on the farm. I, you know, I had lessons and everything, you know. So, I can ride a horse. Can you imagine that? I haven't been on a horse in a very long time. <laughs> but that horse, that big horse, and sometimes they are unruly and they don't want to listen. And yeah, I remember this one day, I, we were visiting my, my uncle's farm, and I was on this horse that I didn't know, and it was a bit of a nakaraka horse. And so we were going out towards the gate, but the, it's a very rocky place, so if you fall off, it's not great, you know. So as we were going back, you know, the sun was setting, it was getting dark, and one of the people that visited drove past, and the, the car driving past us spooked this horse, and it saw the lights on the, on the house, and it just started running. And he just went for it. And then that horse went straight because the, the, the road would turn and there was this gate. And it went straight for the gate. So if this horse jumps the gate, then I have no idea where it's going. So we are going to that house. I was hanging on the side of that horse and I pulled with all my might to pull his head. And there were like skid marks like his, <laughs> as his hoofs turned <laughs> to get to, to the right place. Okay, but uh, I, was, I was not happy with that horse after that. Okay, but the point is, even, even a difficult horse, if you put, put its mouth, it will go. It will just, it will go. So... If, if you can do that with, with a horse that doesn't reason, that doesn't, well, sometimes they do, but that, that, that doesn't have higher thought, that, that, you know, they don't speak, they just kick you or bite you, you know? So, if you can turn that horse, so imagine what can happen if you can turn your mouth. Okay? So he says, Likewise, look at the ships. Though they are so great and are driven by rough winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the impulse of the helmsman determines. Okay, so these big oil tankers on the ocean, compared to the size, the rudder is, isn't very big. I mean, you can't really even see it. It's, compared to the ship, it's really small. But it can turn that whole ship even so, the tongue is a little member and it can boast of great things. Oh, how the tongue can boast. <laughs> See how much wood or how great a forest a tiny spark can set ablaze. Yeah. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a world of wickedness set among our members, contaminating and depraving the whole body and setting on fire the wheel of birth, the cycle of man's nature, being itself ignited by hell. So the tongue is a fire ignited by hell. Or if you go to Acts chapter 2, tongues of fire divided and set upon each of them. And they all started to speak in other tongues. Yeah. So your tongue can be a fire ignited by heaven. Yeah. Let the right fire fire your tongue. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Right, so it's a world of wickedness. It sets on fire the wheel of birth. 
the cycle of man's nature. So it contaminates and it depraves. So the tongue contaminates or depraves the whole body. So to deprave is to make immoral or to make wicked. It's not deprive, that's to withhold something. Deprave, make wicked. So if you speak the wrong stuff, you're going to stir up the wrong desires. If you speak the wrong stuff, the wrong stuff is going to dwell and overpower you. So how do you fight it? How do you get it under control? Get your tongue under control. The only way to get your tongue under control is to get the Holy Spirit on your tongue. The only way to get the Word, which is Spirit and life, on your tongue. Because if you're going to try and get your tongue by your own efforts, try and get your tongue to say the right stuff, it's not going to work. It says, every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea animal can be tamed and has been tamed by human genius or nature. But the human tongue can be tamed by no man or no natural man. It is a restless, undisciplined, irreconcilable evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father and with it we curse men who are made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come forth blessing and cursing. These things, my brethren, ought not to be so. There's a fountain sent forth simultaneously from the same opening fresh water and bitter. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine figs? Neither can a salt spring furnish fresh water. Who is there among you who is wise and intelligent? Then let him by his noble living show forth his good works with the unobtrusive humility which is the proper attribute of true wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy, envy, contention, rivalry, selfish ambition in your hearts, do not pride yourselves on it and thus be in defiance of and false to the truth. This superficial wisdom is not such as come down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, even devilish or demonical. For wherever there is jealousy, envy, contention, rivalry, selfish ambition, there will also be confusion, unrest, disharmony, rebellion, and all sorts of evil and vile practices. But the, sp the wisdom from above is, first of all, pure, undefiled. It's peace-loving, courteous, considerate, gentle, willing to yield to reason, full of compassion and good fruits. It is wholehearted, straightforward, impartial, unfeigned, free from doubts, wavering, and insincerity. And the harvest of righteousness is the fruit of the seed sown in peace by those who work for and make peace. In themselves and in others, that peace, which means concord, agreement, harmony between individuals with undisturbedness in a peaceful mind, free from fears, agitating passions, etc. Or moral conflicts. Okay. So, there's... If we can just refer to the last two weeks. I mean, two weeks ago, we spoke about uh, pursue the holiness that you've received... The, by position, you are, you are in, made holy in Christ. Now we pursue that to manifest in our lives so that we can see that. Last week we spoke about speaking and to, to, to speak the word only. Now, if we just take it again to the two trees. Okay. The one is... Oh, Reverse the order today. The one is from above, the one is from beneath. Okay, both are words. Both are wisdom. But this one is life. And this one is death. This one uh, if you are able to 
speak by the Spirit that which is from above, then you will control your whole body. And you will be a perfect man. This one, if you speak from the... and the, This one has the fire from heaven. And this one has the fire from hell. And if, if, you, if your tongue is here, then you deprave or make wicked or immoral your body. So it turns out what you say does matter, yeah. whether there's someone to hear it or not. Yeah. It's not what goes in to the body, yeah. foods, rituals, laws, legalistic stuff, that defiles someone. It's what comes out. Yeah. So if we're going to speak, Matthew chapter 12 says, uh, by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you'll be judged and condemned. Okay? Then he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. Make the tree good or make the tree evil. Yeah. The good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Yeah. The bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Yeah. So James then also says it's, it's a fountain. And this one is a fountain. This one is a source. This one is a source. So what are we yielding to? Okay? So to, to turn the ship, so to speak, with a rudder, you're going to have to make a few decisions. And when you find yourself speaking in a certain direction... Repent and change what you say until it's natural to you, until it's, you've formed new habits. Because if you're going to really check what you're saying, when you're alone, when this, you know, if you start speaking the word over your situation, your family, your finances, your health, your everything, you will see different fruit come. The message that comes... I'm speaking of message that's preached out of the Bible in churches. Is it this side? Right versus wrong? Good versus evil? Or is it this side? Life. The cross of Christ. So let's just get to it. So the word of God cleanses. When you speak the word of God, it has a cleansing effect. It purges people from their sins. It cleanses the conscience when you speak about the blood of Jesus. When you proclaim the forgiveness of sins because of the blood of Jesus, Acts chapter 13, 38. Okay? When you speak about what Jesus did for the salvation of the world, and you proclaim that... As you speak it, it brings life to you because it leaves your mouth. Okay? That cleanses you. But as you speak it, it cleanses the person you speak to. So there's the one, I mean, you can yield your, your, your tongue to the devil and as you speak it, it defiles your conscience. Or you can yield your tongue and preach the gospel. That's what Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Not in your spare time, talk rubbish over all your circumstances. Go into all the world and preach. You'll say your own house is also all the world, so keep on speaking the gospel. Okay? So now he says in John chapter 15, I am the vine and my father is the vine dresser. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit, that stops bearing, he cuts away, trims off, takes away, and he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit to make it bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. So the fruit-bearing branches are continually cleansed. The fruit-bearing branches are continually cleansed. The others are cut off at the root. 
It's not only the bronze, it's just the whole thing is, is cut away. So you, as in this metaphor, everything in your life that does not bear fruit, God is, is pruning, he's taking it away. Every time you hear the word and every time you speak the word, it cleanses you. So as you speak the word of God, you are being cleansed. So the blood of Jesus cleanses you and keeps you cleansed from sin in all its forms and manifestations. First John chapter 1. The blood of Christ cleanses your conscience from dead works and lifeless observance as you serve the living God. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13 and 14. Okay, so it's a cleansing thing. Okay, he says, you are cleansed and pruned already because of the word which I have given you, the teachings I have discussed with you. Dwell in me, I will dwell in you. Live in me, I will live in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit of itself without abiding in the vine, without abiding being vitally united to the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. What is the fruit of it? He says, verse 7, If you live, abide vitally united to me, and my words remain in you. See the words that's remaining in you? And continue to live in your hearts. Ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. So that means if the right word dwells in you and if the right word leaves your mouth, okay, whatever you ask will be done for you. When you bear much fruit, my Father is honored and glorified. So what's the fruit bearing? That you get what you ask when you pray. Okay? And you prove yourselves to be true followers of mine. I have loved you just as the Father has loved me. Abide in my love. Continue in his love with me. If you keep my commandments, if you continue to obey my instructions, you will abide in my love and live on in it, just as I have obeyed my Father's commandments and live on in his love. John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them. Purify, consecrate, separate them for yourself, make them holy. By the truth, your word is truth. So if you are on this side, you're hearing this, you're standing at the tree of life and not the tree of the knowledge of good. Now there's fruit, which is words, and in the fruit there's seeds. Now you eat that. Now you, that seed starts to grow in you, that word becomes flesh, and you, you become a tree of life in your own life. Okay? Blessed is the man who walks not after the counsel of the ungodly, he is the lightest in the law of the Lord, he shall be like a tree planted. So the moment you are busy with the word of God, you, it, you, it becomes flesh in you, you become it. So what leaves your mouth will be the same as the seed that is planted on the inside of you. Okay. He says, your word is truth. Sanctify them by your word. So you are set apart so unholy things cannot touch you. Depraved things cannot come close to you. So that means immediately you are separated from this kind of speech. Okay? Sanctify them by the truth. So what's the truth? It's the cross. That word of the blood of Jesus that cleanses your conscience, that is the word that sanctifies you. Okay, let's just take it again to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 9. According to this will of God, we have been made holy through what? The offering of the flesh body of Jesus Christ once for the truth. So the truth sanctifies you as you hear it and as you speak it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Okay? You have been cleansed, pruned, purged, sanctified. Because of the words that I've spoken to you. So if we really preach the true gospel of the blood of Christ, 
when we put our faith in what Jesus did on the cross, okay, that cleanses the hearer. Okay? So Paul writes to Timothy and he also says to him, see, uh, look well to your teaching because you will both save yourself and those who hear you. Okay. All right, so we need to be sanctified. How are we sanctified? By hearing the gospel. That is what made us holy. The offering of the flesh body of Jesus Christ once for all. All right. So there's something cleansing about the word, which is the gospel. So let's just look at a few scriptures. Ephesians chapter 5. That anyone can, you know, if this is like one of the most obvious ones. First he says in verse 11, take no part in and have no fellowship with the fruitless deeds and enterprises of darkness. But instead let your lives be so in contrast as to expose and reprove or convict them. For it is a shame even to speak of or mention the things that such people practice in secret. So all the people with the websites of what everyone else is doing. Listen, the Bible says it's a shame to speak of it. So we don't want to go with the magnifying glass to this preacher and that preacher, to this move and that move to see what's wrong. I am not interested in what's wrong. I'm interested in what's right. I'm not interested in what pastor so-and-so has messed up. We all often stumble and 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 fall and offend in many things there. Okay? So I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is the victory. And that victory comes through Jesus Christ. Okay. So we're not going to talk about, oh, the Satanists are doing this and, you know, the occult is doing that. And No, we're going to be talking about what Jesus is doing. Okay? Pray because there's five Satanists that, you know, speaking curses over centurion, don't break the chain. It's like, oh, please. I mean, here we are. How many people in the, in the building, we are all in one accord, in one place. I mean, Jesus said, if any two of you are gathered in my name, there I will be. So Jesus is here in this meeting. We are all here filled with the Holy Ghost. We're talking about the Word of God. And people are worried about five Satanists that are speaking curses over. Oh, come on, man. The light being afraid of the darkness. That, that is not, yeah, that doesn't work. Verse 13, but when anything is exposed and reproved, by the light it is made visible and clear, and where everything is visible and clear there is light. Therefore he says, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ shall make day dawn upon you and give you light. So awake, if, if you're spiritually asleep, awake, Christ will open your eyes, he will make day dawn upon you, and you will have light. Okay. So now, let's just go to verse 22. This is not a wedding, but you know, this is a good scripture. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. And now, you know, many people have a knee-jerk reaction. Oh, I don't know, I don't know. You know, is now going back before 1984 with the marital right that we, you know, no, 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 that's not what I mean. Because it says here in verse 21, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. So it's not talking about the suppression of anybody. But we are subject to one another. But listen, he says, for the husband is head of the wife, Christ is the head of the church. So, um, Himself, the Savior of his body. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her. So if a husband wants to subdue his wife in some way, you know, and you must subject unto me, under me, be subject to me. Trying to force the whole thing. Hey, what about husband love your wives? 
as Christ loved the church. As Christ loved the church. So what is that likeness? It is sacrificial love. Because he gave himself up for her. Listen, so that he might sanctify her. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor. Without spot or wrinkle or any such things. That she might be holy and faultless. Even so, husbands should love their wives as being in sense their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. So, wives, is it difficult or easy to subject to that kind of love? Yeah. Okay. So, that's not, the, the big deal here is not for wives to be subject to everything that their husband dishes out at them. But, listen, husbands. Let's see how Christ loved the, the church. Let's see how Christ cleansed the church with the washing of the water by the word. And let's take that and start speaking as Christ speaks. So what do we speak over our families? What do we speak over our wives? What do we speak over our children? Is the words that come out of our mouth cleansing them or contaminating them? Is it depriving them or is it separating them from unholy things? And after, after you spoke to your wife, she just feels, man, now I can just go heal the sick and raise the dead. After you spoke to your wife, now she's just imparted by grace in the anointing and power. Now she can just run with fire. So what are we speaking? Okay. So we can cleanse someone or we can contaminate someone by speaking. But as we cleanse someone else, we are cleansed because it's a cleansing flow. As we uh, contaminate someone else, we contaminate ourselves. So you're not the strong macho guy when you curse someone. You, you mess up your own life by doing it. Okay? So the old people had, a, had something right when they said count to ten before you say anything, you know, or hold your tongue. Something that I really enjoy of, of David Hogan, who knows who David Hogan is. So he would say, you know, <laughs> because he's, he's just kind of a, an abrasive character, you know, <laughs> but he's, uh, he's just actually just a big ball of love. He's not really, you know, maybe until you cross him, I don't think that's a good, you know, if you do something to the church, you're going you're gonna to get a talking to. <laughs> but he would stand, he would preach to people, and would say, you know, before he would say something, you know, like, and he would just hold his tongue. <laughs> and I, re I remember, Prophet Kuebas also said it, he, he said, he says, just take your tongue and hold it. And they say, if it wasn't for you, <laughs> if it wasn't for you. So what could have been manifested in your life already? What glory of God could we have seen already? What atmosphere is hanging around you because of what you speak? What could have been manifested and what is manifested all because of what we say? Listen, if we're going to put ourselves on a stringent word diet and eat the word and speak the word, do you, do you have any idea how quickly your situation can change? Not an emotion diet, feasting on your own emotions and speaking it, and a word diet, and it will even transform your emotions. Okay? So... Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water by the word. Titus chapter 3. Almost done. Verse 4 says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God, our, of God our Savior, to man appeared, 
He saved us, not because of any good works of righteousness that we had done, but because of his own pity and mercy, by the cleansing bath of the new birth, the regeneration, and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm going to read the King James as well. It says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Galatians chapter 3, how did you receive the Holy Ghost? By believing the word. So how did the washing come? It was by hearing the word and believing the word. Okay. It was according to his mercy. So the washing of regeneration, as you hear it, your conscience is suddenly cleansed. All the accusation is removed. All the evil stuff, all the evil desires is removed. And as you start speaking it, man, there's something flowing through you. It washes your mind. It washes your tongue. It washes your soul. It washes everything. Let the word flow through you, man. Let it, let it flow through you and bless you in, in every respect and in everything. First Timothy chapter 4. The Holy Spirit distinctly and expressly declares that in latter times some will turn away from the faith, giving attention to deluding and seducing spirits and doctrines that demons teach. So if it's, if it's not doctrinally word, step away from it. If it's a lie, it brings death. So it can sound great, but if, it, if it's not the truth, it will not sanctify you. It will deprave you. So people think, you know, okay, but, you know, they, they preach, you know, or, but it's just this one thing. Or, listen, if the, no, no church is perfect. Let me just say that. But if, it's, if there's stuff that's not truth, the not truth part will start to will spread like leaven. Okay? And it will go everywhere. So he says, doctrines that demons teach through the hypocrisy and pretensions of liars, so it's people who are not speaking truth that sanctifies you, whose consciences are seared or, or cauterized. King James is a bit more dramatic this time. He says, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know, have you seen, you know, when they give the numbers to cattle? <laughs> well, who's seen that enterprise ad from years ago? You know, enterprise, you know, okay. Who forbid people to marry and teach them to abstain from certain kinds of foods. Here we go again. I mean, everyone wants to be a Jew now these days again, you know. Now everyone is going back to matzos and you know kosher and uh, listen blessed jews we're not against the jews um god says you know he loves them paul says in romans chapter 10 that it, in, it's his desire that they all may be saved but if you read the letters of paul he was pretty severe about it that we don't return to their rituals and their customs okay that's the old stuff that god has removed okay he says, uh, we forbid people to marry, to abstain from certain kinds of foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and have an increasingly clear knowledge of the truth. Okay, God, everything God has created is good and nothing is to be thrown away or refused if it is received with thanksgiving. So, there's good scripture for you to thank God for the food that you're about to eat and bless it to your bodies. It's not a, re a re uh, religious thing. It's awesome scripture. It's good, so do it. Okay. It is hallowed and consecrated by the word of God. So if you speak over your food, I don't care if uh, or if you're 
who sang over your food before the time, if you praise God for it, you thank Him for it, it is sanctified and consecrated. So they can put 10 halal stickers and a kosher sticker and a whatever, and even if a Hindu has burnt incense next to that cow, I don't care, well, they don't eat cows, you know, I don't, I don't care, or, or the beetroot or whatever it is, you know, so it's consecrated by the word of God and by prayer. Speak, man. <laughs> okay. All right. Ah, I think it's the, it came over. Let's just pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness. We just pray that you touch our mouths and that our mouths, our speech, will be sanctified unto the Lord by the truth. Let our lips be filled with the truth. Let us speak the truth. Let us think the truth. Let us hear the truth. Let us live the truth. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can add. I was you just thinking, add. just on a practical level, you know, when you start changing the course of a ship, it sometimes, the bigger the ship, it take, the, the more time it takes, you know, to, to turn, to turn the ship. And um, so on a practical level, I think sometimes when we have a certain way of speaking, we almost feel shy for lack of a better word, to start speaking differently because people are so used to speaking, that we speak in a certain way, especially in a family setup. I remember when Gerrit and I really started taking this word seriously in terms of speaking something different. You know, it's almost yeah. this uncomfortable tension of you want to say it different, but you're so used to, let's say, moaning about this or grumbling about the finances or whatever. So the... To, to start speaking differently, have grace for yourself, mm. but it's also not something to judge, you know? So if he now says mm. something wrong, it's not, you know what we heard on Sunday, you know, like, <laughs> sis for you. So Doing the, the exact the, opposite <laughs> of the word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so the, the whole purpose is not to judge people who haven't started changing what they say. We still continue to love. But something on a practical level that we just do is, let's say, he complains just for practical reasons. Yes, I hear you. So let's quickly make a declaration. Mm. You know, okay, so let's quickly pray. You know, and you start changing, changing even though you've said the yeah. wrong things, if I can say quickly it like that. Quickly agree on it. Yeah, you say it. Yeah. yeah, so then you just, you know, say, okay, we, we've said that now. Receive the grace and speak, speak life. It was just something that yeah, I was thinking. That's about. awesome. Or Appreciate when you actually have family that notices the change in your life and then they start mocking you saying, oh, are you now suddenly holy that you now only say this? Yes, I am. <laughs> You're right. Thank you for noticing. You know? <laughs> so because that kind of thing, that kind of, that kind of uh, criticism can quench people. Don't. Don't let it. You have died. I mean, you've got nothing to lose. So just speak what God speaks.